Welcome everybody. Hello and welcome to the McKell Institute's special inside look at the 2020 Queensland state election. My name's Ryan Batchelor. I'm the executive director of the McKell Institute in Victoria and I'll be hosting today's discussion. I'll be joined shortly by our two guests and I'll introduce them from both sides of the uh, political landscape here in, um, uh, in Queensland and both with deep experience of Queensland state politics. First of all, can I acknowledge that wherever you're joining us from, we're meeting today on Aboriginal land. For me, in this part of Melbourne, it's the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. Can I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and to acknowledge any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians joining us today. Well, these are interesting times in state politics. Um, as a Victorian, our Premier, he's always in the news. Uh, our friends in New South Wales have seen Gladys Berejiklian and very firmly in the spotlight over the last couple of weeks. In Queensland, you're in the midst of a state election and voters will have their say on who will lead your state for the next four years on Saturday week. The big questions confronting us are, can Anastasia Palaszczuk win her third election, which is all, certainly a long way from when she took over as the Labor leader in the aftermath of a state election when the entire state caucus could have fit into a van? Or will Deb Frecklington take the LNP to victory? Uh, a victory that would certainly um, be, uh, be a turn up for the, for, the, for the LNP given that Labor has held power in Queensland for 25 of the last 30 years. Queensland is the first Australian state to go to the polls in our post-pandemic world. So it'll be interesting today to have a part of our conversation to talk about the impact that COVID has had on both the process um, and the politics of this election campaign. Um, the two territories in Australia have had elections this year. First, the, the Northern Territory in August and the ACT, of course, had their election last weekend. And our cousins across the ditch also last Saturday overwhelmingly re-elected the New Zealand Labor Party under Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern, which does raise the question, in the post-COVID world, does incumbency provide a sense of electoral invincibility? Will Queensland follow the pattern of these other states or are we going to see a change of government uh, in, our, in our nation um, and, and certainly in our region for the first time? in a very long time. I'm joined today by two, two guests and I'll introduce them now. First of all, Rachel Nolan, um, who many of you from Queensland may know. She's the executive chair of the McKell Institute in Queensland. Um, she's a former state Labor member of parliament, the member for Ipswich, uh, and a former minister in previous Labor governments serving as uh, in a range of ministerial portfolios, including finance, transport, uh, natural resources. And Graham Young, who's the executive director of the Australian Institute of Progress, uh, a centre-right think tank based in uh, Brisbane, and also is a former campaign chair for the Queensland Liberal Party. So extensive experience of state politics in Queensland. I'm really uh, glad and grateful that both of you could join us here today. So thanks very much, Graham, and thanks very much, Rachel. Um, there are two broad areas I want to cover today. Uh, one is the politics of what's going on in Queensland right now. So someone who's looking at uh, the Queensland election from afar, uh, I'm interested to understand a little bit more about really what have been the big issues, how has politics played out over the course of this campaign? Um, how does that compare to how politics usually plays out in Queensland? Is this an election like no other, or is this an election that's basically been the same as everyone that's come before it? A bit of that today. I'm also interested in covering some of the policy implications of today's election, both in terms of what the parties themselves have prioritised, but also to have a bit of a sense of what we expect the shape of the policy landscape to look like if there's a re-elected Labor government or if there's a change to the LNP. And particularly, and I want to come to this question about, you know, will the nature of, um, of government in Queensland change at all? Um, as a result of the campaign that we're seeing today. Um, there's lots to cover. Um, I've got a, 
I've got a range of questions that I know I'd like to get through, but I'm also really keen for those who are joining us uh, online today to be able to engage in the conversation. So um, we've got a Q&A function opening. And for those of you um, who've spent a long time on Zoom over the course of this pandemic, I'm sure you're very familiar with how that works. So please, if you've got questions over the course of the conversation today, uh, put them in the, in the Q&A, uh, put them in the chat, have a look. Um, uh, at, at what's being said and pose some, some questions of your own. Um, I'll keep an eye on what's been going on um, in both the chat and the Q&A. Maybe I'll interject some of those questions over the course or we'll get to some more substantive ones um, at the end. But I'm really keen to, for you to participate a bit more um, as, as audience members in today's conversation. So that's really my setup. Now to hear from Graham and Rachel. If you can... Uh, get to the sort of crux of this question. What's the camp election campaign been like in Queensland so far? Is it as we've expected them to go or has it been fundamentally different because of the nature of, of, the, of the pandemic? Graham, do you want to kick off? <laughs> Ladies first. Oh, thanks very much. <laughs> um, look, You're I'm, up my screen, Rachel. So, <laughs> look, I'm, I'm happy to go first. Um, it's. I think this is a dead set weird one, to be honest. Um, there's a lot about this that is a sort of bog standard Queensland election. You know, there's a lot of. Um, campaigning on infrastructure projects and, and economic development in the regional towns up the state, up the, up the coast, which is um, your kind of standard visual of a Queensland election campaign. But it's, it's different from the normal rollout in a few senses. Um, firstly, for the first time in any Australian major Australian jurisdiction, there are two women leaders. Um, and that's gone virtually unremarked, which is, I think, just really dead set interesting in itself. So that's the kind of interesting background. Um, secondly, you know, it's, it feels here, and I'm sure it doesn't feel in Victoria, but it feels here like it's on the back of a pandemic. Um, so there is a bit of optimism in Queensland that we're sort of towards the end of, of things now. Um, you know, that may or may not be borne out to be true, but the pandemic absolutely has framed, of course, the context of, of the year. And it really feels a bit like we've sort of scrambled to have an election campaign at, at the end. So it was the sort of framing context, but it ha hasn't totally defined um, the election discussion itself. And the third thing that um, feels tremendously different to me is, um, it's come just after all those news limited cuts in regional papers. So this, this to me feels like the first dead set um, Queensland social media election. And that makes many of the normal indicators about what are the issues, particularly in the regional seats, really hard to read. So my point is similar thematics, but a lot unknowns, a lot of unknowns in a way that I don't recall having experienced, you know, in the 30 years that I've been watching Queensland elections. Yeah, look, this isn't the uh, election that I would have been scripting if I was running the LNP campaign 12 months ago. I think that election would have uh, looked at Labor's record, it would have um, picked them uh, up on their uh, delivery or non-delivery of infrastructure, it would have picked them up on overspending, it would have picked them up on uh, failure to deliver on unemployment, uh, and it would have picked them up in terms of the increase in debt here uh, without any commensurate uh, outcome. Uh, I think COVID has changed everything, um, and you know, that will be the case all around the world. Uh, I can't see how you can have something as significant as the pandemic, uh, which has brought about a uh, a top-down approach to government, even from people like uh, Morrison, who are, you know, allegedly liberals. Uh, it's been very much a command and control performance. At the same time, it's changed a lot of the things that we're doing. So at the Australian Institute for Progress, we do our own qualitative polling, and uh, 
I've spoken to, spoken in inverted commas, uh, to 249 people via an online qualitative survey. And what I gleaned out of that, and it's confirmed by the campaigns that are being run by both sides of politics, is that people uh, are basically, they're looking through COVID. Um, politicians are only as good as their as the future, not the past. And a good illustration of that is that uh, Winston Churchill wins World War II and then he loses the next election, obviously because he wasn't offering by that stage what people wanted. He'd, he'd done that job. Now we want someone to do the next job. So people looking through COVID, they take that as something which is um, for granted. You mentioned Jacinda Ardern before. Well, uh, you might not be aware in Victoria, but uh, in New Zealand, they had four times as many deaths from COVID as we did here in Queensland for a similar population. Uh, so in terms of COVID and in terms of the health impact, it barely touched us. And in fact, some parts of the, uh, the country uh, didn't even see any cases, really. You know, you go west of Brisbane or you go uh, the bit between here and uh, Townsville and Cairns and there was basically nothing. Um, but there's been an economic impact. Uh, so what people are, are saying is, look, COVID's come along, uh, it's changed the way we do things, uh, it's had an economic impact on us, but it also gives us an opportunity to change the way we do things. So I think the public's actually been looking to the politicians to answer the question as to how we reboot. And I think that the population has been uh, severely disappointed that what we've seen from both sides of politics is a a vote buying spree with you know little sweetmeats here and sweetmeats there to try and buy this electorate or that electorate or keep it on side. But we haven't actually seen a coherent narrative and an explanation as to where they see Queensland in four years time. Uh, and there hasn't really been much talking about how you restructure the economy after COVID. Uh, and that's disappointing too, because you know I think both sides should have something to say about it. To what extent do you think things like the, I was flicking through the Courier Mail online today, I saw another another call for borders to be reopened. It's been an issue which has popped up on several occasions over the course of the campaign. How much has the handling of the public health measures and how much has things like border closures um, impacted on how people perceive uh, both leaders in the course of this campaign? Well, I, I think if I can go First this time, Rachel. Um, so the, the election is basically about the economy, uh, but Labor is taking its ability uh, to control the borders and control COVID as proof of its ability to control the economy. Uh, so they get very good marks from across the board uh, for the low rate of infection here. And there's a high level of support even amongst LNP voters for closing the borders. Now, that might vary a bit where you are in the state. So if you're down the, the Gold Coast, uh, where uh, uh, Coolangatta and Tweed Heads are called the Twin Towns for the reason that basically they straddle the border and the residents there don't see any difference between one side or the other, then it could be different uh, because it's been a major disruption to people living there. And if you're up in Cairns, which is heavily dependent uh, on fly-in tourism, uh, where again it's had an effect, it might be quite different, but most parts of the state, people are, are grateful that uh, we've had low rate of infection and they uh, tie that back to keeping the borders closed, so give Anastasia big marks for it. The, the subtext, and I don't think this is actually, a, a, I don't think it's written down or I haven't seen it, but the subtext of the Labor campaign is essentially um, that Anastasia Palaszczuk kept us safe so she can make us strong. Um, so there is a, as Graham touched on, the sort of controversial nature of the border closures, but ultimately most of the evidence suggests that um, they are popularly supported. Um, the LNP, like conservatives around the country, um, ran pretty hot and cold over the you know over previous months on whether the borders should be open or, or closed. So, um, for instance, the leader of the LNP was calling pretty loudly for the Queensland border to be open 
right when Victoria was starting to go into the second wave. And so one of Labor's attacks, um, you know, on the basis of, of that has been that the LNP really were a bit all over the place. Um, I spent a few days last week um, at Cool and Gatto where Graham's talking about, and the atmosphere there was, was sort of verging on um, celebratory. You know, it's glorious in the sunshine. You can now go back and forth across the border. There's a bubble to Northern New South Wales. So it's, it's, there's not that sense of closure. And I think the sense that, you know, for a cliche, life is great in the sunshine state when you're aware that it's not elsewhere in, in the country and in the world is, you know, you don't have to say it. There's just this background consciousness of that all the time. Um, so I think, you know, I think Graham's right and, and wrong. I, I think it's true that people don't necessarily give you um, the tick for work done, but that sort of subtext of we don't really have COVID here and life is um, for most people, not everyone, there have been job losses, but for most people really pretty normal, there is an understanding in the community that that's by and large on the back of, of border closures that were kind of hard to do. So then the next point, and I agree with Graham on this, then the next point is, okay, so what's the campaign about? Um, and the campaign, Queensland campaigns are always about economic development to a greater or lesser degree. And this one's about economic recovery. Um, so that's where the discussion is now going. Um, and in that sense, um, Labor's essentially running a sort of, is not trying to spend a huge amount of money because there is a debt load. Um, so Labor's essentially trying to run um, some infrastructure spending largely in renewables um, and some targeted job creating pro um, projects, particularly in the regions. The LNP is talking about similar stuff. We can talk about this in more detail. Um, but they have some really big infrastructure commitments. And that's kind of been the discussion over the last few weeks. How is the, I mean, Queensland is a, is a big state and also known for being one that's more decentralised than other parts of the country. How has both the crisis um, affected the state? Is it different in different parts? And therefore, how is the campaign and, their pol and the, the parties campaigning and the, and the policy initiatives uh, adjusted to, those, to, that, to, that, um, to that dynamic? It's different. Oh. I'll go first. Um, look, most of Queensland, dead set, feels like there is not a pandemic. Um, I live in Ipswich. Uh, you know, my life has changed in that I no longer go to Sydney for work. But if I walk down the main street here, it really feels the same. If I go to a cafe, I have to fill in a form. Um, that wasn't always true. You know, we had a period of, of staying home in the first few months, but in most places, things feel pretty normal. Um, the exceptions to that, but Queensland has a very big tourism industry. So that's the dead set mm. exception. Um, and the tourism, but there have been variations in that, in that local tourism has gone nuts. You know, nobody goes to Bali. So um, the Gold Coast at the last school holidays had pretty reasonable occupancy. Um, because people holidayed in Queensland. Um, Cairns has really suffered, as have, parts of the, has, as have parts of the Sunshine Coast. You know, people from Melbourne um, go to Cairns or Noosa in the wintertime because it's glorious. So if you... And Cairns relies on a lot of overseas tourism to the Great Barrier Reef. So that's obviously, you know, totally kaput. So I would say that for most of the people, most of the time, life feels reasonably normal. Um, in Brisbane, people may well be working from home to a greater extent, but the, the really serious hit is if you, if you work in tourism and that's highly regionalised, particularly to Cairns and, and the coast, the Sunshine and Gold Coasts. Yeah, look, I, I don't think that the... Um... The issues have changed really from what you would normally see, Ryan. It's just that uh, the, uh, 
the sort of the, the medium through which you interpret them has changed a bit. So to use a musical terminology, it's, it's kind of like the difference between playing something on the piano uh, or perhaps playing on the, um, on the harmonica. You know, you, you're going to be playing the same notes, but you're not going to play them the same way or it won't make, make sense. So, so the issues in Queensland are economic, um, but, but they're different economic uh, issues in different areas of the state. So Rachel's talked about tourism, but, you know, we're a big agricultural and mining state. Uh, and, you know, we and Western Australia are, are similar in that respect. Uh, they've got more mining than we have, which is something I think a state government here should, uh, should try and make up for. Uh, so, um, so in the city of Brisbane, it's possibly not dissimilar in a lot of respects to, say, Sydney or, or Melbourne in terms of what people are uh, concerned about. There's less manufacturing here. It's more distribution, uh, construction, uh, retirement even um, area. But then once you get out west, uh, even to Ipswich, where, where Rachel is, then attitudes change. Um, it's an old mining town, uh, Ipswich, coal mining and so on, and those sorts of attitudes are still there. And then after Ipswich, Toowoomba's your next big town and, and you're into agricultural issues there. Same thing happens when you go north of uh, Noosa. Uh, and al along with those particular industries also go uh, a different um, um, uh, cultural way of looking at things. Uh, so there's a, always a bit of a culture war going on within uh, Queensland with elections. Uh, and that's, again, compounded by people up in the north of the state uh, having a real sense of uh, dislocation from people in the south of the state. There's a very strong movement in the north of the state to have a separate state up there, for example. One of my favourite examples of uh, northern separateness is that my mum... Uh, was born in 1922. She went down to Melbourne uh, in about 1943, I think, to be in the WAF during the war. When I was growing up as a kid, she would sound off about Southerners. And she wasn't talking about people in Sydney and Melbourne. She was talking about me living in Brisbane. She'd left Kansas a 20-something-year-old, but it had never got out of her blood. Um, it's still up there in the same way. So there's a number of things that play together and make it makes it very difficult for a political party to run on a lot of issues without getting wedged um, between constituencies. So, you know, if you want to run on renewable energies, uh, you upset people who mine coal uh, or who want to see manufacturing uh, and don't think you can do it uh, with renewables. That's just one example. In terms of this electoral geography, obviously, where are elections won and lost in Queensland? Is it is it, is it Brisbane and its suburbs, the sort of classic swing, urban swing voter, or is it a more of an issue about convincing those large regional seats and those large regional towns? Um, how does that interplay work as someone who doesn't really sort of understand, doesn't have a lot of experience about the day-to-day -day, um, campaigning and electoral geography of Queensland? Can we talk a bit about how that works um, and also how, how you think the parties have handled it, given that um, they're obviously um, in, the midst, in the midst of a pretty fierce battle. Yeah, okay, look, if we're doing a turn and turn about, it must be my turn. It is. Uh, the, um, it's moved around where you win elections. You know, there, there has been movement. The uh, ALP is not as strong as it used to be in the country. Um, and uh, its strength is now concentrated uh, in Brisbane and the southeast. Um, that wasn't always the case. So back in the, uh, the 60s and the 70s, it was fairly even in Brisbane. Uh, now you've got the LNP only holding four seats in Brisbane, um, which one ought to put that in context. At the Brisbane City Council level, uh, it's the Labor Party that only owns six seats in Brisbane. So it's quite volatile in Brisbane, but at the moment, I can't see much of a shift there. And I think it would be hard for the ALP to pick up extra seats. Uh, the seat that would be uh, on the swings easiest for them to pick up is Clayfield. Uh, I basically live in Clayfield and I've seen very little labour activity there, which says they don't think they've got a chance. By the same token, I can't see the LNP picking up uh, anything much in Brisbane, if anything at all. Um, when you go to the, the Golden Sunshine Coast, they're pretty much owned by the LNP at the moment. There's some prospects there, though, for the ALP to pick up a couple. Um, when you get out um, 
Well, when you then get to the ring around Brisbane, so you've got the, the, the Brisbane City Council area, then you've got the sort of Brisbane statistical area. Outside of that, the ALP again is pretty dominant. So there's not much that they can pick up. In that area, the LNP really owns a couple of seats and no more. Uh, then when you get out into the, the west of the Great Divide, that's National Party territory. And it, it has been since the 1957 ALP DLP split. So I don't see anything changing there and it hasn't changed there for roughly 60 years. Uh, so I think where this election might change the government is in the area of sort of from Noosa up to, to Cairns. Uh, and that's an area where Scott Morrison won big swings uh, around seats like Rockhampton. Rockhampton at a state level being a Labor Party stronghold, which I think the last time it elected a, a non-Labor member was Rex Pillbeam in about 1974. Uh, so, you know, it's solidly Labor. But uh, uh, Michelle Landry in, in Capricornia got a 10% swing to her. So around that area would be interesting to watch up in news, uh, in Townsville and, and Cairns. Uh, there's the most marginal Labor seats. Uh, however, you know, my best uh, prognostication is that uh, the LNP couldn't possibly win a majority in their own right. They need to win nine seats to do that. Um, so their best chance is a minority government. Um, I think the ALP's best chance is to more or less maintain the number of seats that they hold by swapping a few in the, in the north with a few in the southeast. Rachel, if that's the case, talk to us a bit about where the other parties are at. We obviously know, you know, where you come from, sort of birthplace of One Nation at some point in the mid-1990s. Um, but we've also got Catters Australia Party um, in the north and then, of course, Clive Palmer. What's the impact of the other parties having on this campaign? Will they have any role? Will they win any seats? Are they, as they, are they likely to feature in the next parliament? And what sort of impact do you think that's going to have? Uh, it's a great question. I'm just going to add something to what Graham said uh, before I get to it. Every, I agree with Graham's assessment across the board. Everything you said is right. Um, Brisbane is really interesting and is unlike Sydney and Melbourne in that in, in Queensland, historically, the National Party are the dominant Conservative Party. So now merged, but, you know, the LNP still, you know, the Liberals and the Nationals are, are still philosophically quite different. And so the reason, the historical reason why you've got this dead set sort of state Labor hegemony in Brisbane, where there are lots and lots of seats, is that there has been uh, an historical view that people in Brisbane couldn't quite bring themselves to vote national. Now, um, and, and to some extent that remains the case. It really changed. Campbell Newman was seen as being the first Liberal Premier of, of Queensland, um, but was then sort of such a disaster that we lost a whole bunch of seats in, in Brisbane in 2012 and sort of thought, oh my gosh, you know, the, the electoral dynamics have really fundamentally changed. And lots of people thought it's gonna be very hard for us to win back seats in, in Brisbane once the Libs get established. Um, but then we just won them all back in 2015. Um, and the, the leader, the LNP leader now, um, represents Joe Bielke-Peterson's old seat. So while the LNP are a, a, a singular beast these days, there's still a bit of sort of liberal national dynamics that underlies it all in terms of the messaging and the themes. And that's really why, to some extent, there's, um, there's this dead set, set, set block of... Um, of Labor votes and Labor seats in, in, in Brisbane. Um, your question was about uh, minor parties and sort of general, you know, gen the general madness um, associated therewith. So, <laughs> um, look, there are three right-wing minor parties. Um, One Nation who've got one seat um, now, but um, you know, are always kicking around. One Nation always comes second, not the Liberals in Ipswich. Um, you know, the same is true in Rockhampton. Um, the same is, is true in a whole lot of seats. So there, are all, so there are all those seats where One Nation will get 30 or more percent of the vote, but generally speaking, won't win. 
And that is likely to be the case this time. Um, you know, there's obviously Clive Palmer who's spending a lot of money, um, but won't win any seats. So his influence is, is in the form of messaging rather than electorally. Um, and there's less impact, there'll be less impact in the state election from him and from that than there was in the federal election for two reasons. Um, one is, you know, if you do that stuff often enough, everybody does, you just begin to think you're a bit of a loon. Um, you lose some credibility over time. And I think that's kind of where we're going. Um, but also there are um, state funding caps. So he can't spend $80 million in the state election. Then you get to the Catters Australia Party, you know, who are their own quite different beast. So um, they are, you can't categorise them as just lunatic right-wingers. Um, you know, they're much more sort of traditional Labor um, or traditional National Party, sort of economically nationalist, social, socially conservative. And because they're geographically concentrated up around Bob Catter's federal seat, um, they hold three seats, um, which, well, two of which they'll most certainly win back, um, and the third they may well. So they totally come into play um, in the event that there's a minority, uh, that we end up in negotiations around a minority government. And which way they would go is really interesting because they're not, you know, while, while Catter didn't back Gillard in 2010, and most of those voters would tend to be conservative leaning, um, you can't just see them in, this, in that sort of far right frame like you can with the other minor parties. Then in Brisbane, um, there are a number of, any, there's one Greens seat in uh, the inner city, which they won for the first time at the last election, knocking off a pretty well-established lib. Um, there's a huge contest that everybody's fascinated about um, between uh, a second time around Greens candidate and the former Deputy Premier Jackie Trad in South Brisbane, which could in the, go in either the, way. In the chat, could be interested in, in yes, uh, well, in definitely about that. So that is well understood to you know that it could go either way. But what happened last time that everybody was talking was that everybody was talking about South Brisbane, and then the Greens unexpectedly won this other seat. So, you know, the Greens are in play in the inner city, um, and I mean the Greens do that thing that they always do where they say, oh, we're on the verge of a breakthrough. Um, they may or may not be, but, you know, once again, that's a sort of live discussion in inner city Brisbane seats. Yeah. Right, that seat. Can I add a couple of yeah, things to, to what Rachel said? Um, in South Brisbane, Jackie Trad, I mean, I'd put money on her going. The reason being that last election, the LNP uh, preferenced against the Greens. This election, they're preferencing to the Greens. Um, and uh, even preferencing against the Greens last election, there was a reasonable flow to the Greens. Uh, statistics I've seen from uh, Melbourne, I think it was, suggests that when the how to vote card suggests voting for the Greens, the overwhelming number of Liberals will do it. Um, in that case, I'd say that, uh, that Jack is gone. Uh, another thing that I'd add to it is that if Labor fails this election, uh, one moment that they uh, should be seared into their memory uh, is when uh, Stephen Miles, who's the uh, Deputy Premier and the Health Minister, uh, made the comment about the minor parties that they were, quote, freaks and weirdos. Now, that reminds me of Hillary Clinton uh, in the 2016 USA election referring to a basket of deplorables. That, I think, was what cost her the election over there because you get a... When you tell people who are thinking of voting a particular way that they basically don't count as people, you alienate them. And this time around, we have... Uh, compulsory preferential. Uh, last uh, election, it was uh, optional preferential. When it's compulsory preferential, those people have to allocate a preference. And I think that Stephen Miles just uh, guaranteed that the flow will go more strongly than it normally does to the LNP, and those preferences will count in a number of seats. So very, very bad uh, politics. One of the things we often see in elections where it, um can be relatively close is the sort of unexpected independent that pops up and someone's asked a question in the chat here about independence do we is there anywhere around the around the state that you think we might see a sort of strong local 
uh, surprise independent cut, bolt from the blue? Not that I can really think of, so I'll, I'll throw it to Graham. One kind of popped up dead set out of the blue last time. There's a woman called Sandy Bolton, who's, an, who's the independent um, member for Noosa. And that's really interesting because, um, and she, she'll probably win again. Um, that's interesting because uh, that was a pretty well-established conservative seat, although we held it for a couple of terms uh, in the Beatty government when we held sort of everything. Um, but, it, but she's that sort of, but it has a real sort of environmental crossover. So you start to get independence in that sort of dynamic. And so she popped up um, and continues to be popped up. Uh, there hasn't, I haven't seen any commentary and I sort of haven't got wind of any um, kind of credible independence anywhere else, but I don't know about you, Graham. Yeah, well, Sandy Bolton in Noosa, um, she ran for mayor and missed out, but she raised her profile as a result of that. Um, uh, Glenn Elms, who was the local member, I think was regarded as being a little bit um, lazy and, and uh, also um, uh, literally out to lunch. Uh, so seen around the, the flesh pots of Noosa too much. Uh, and she came in with a lot of energy in a social media campaign. Um, I was aware of her probably two weeks, I think, before the election. Um, and that was because Glenn Elms uh, um, had the feeling he was in trouble. Um, now, um, there's a, a similar situation potentially uh, in Ujuru, uh, which is a seat that was formerly called Cleveland. Um, now, for those of you who don't know, Brisbane Cleveland uh, is in the Redland Bay area uh, to the east of Brisbane. Uh, and that seat uh, takes in uh, uh, Cleveland uh, north to Thornlands, I think, on the mainland, but also takes in uh, North Stradbroke Island. Uh, the member there, uh, Mark Robinson, a 6 or 7% margin, uh, which is fairly healthy. Um, but the candidate running against him is a woman who ran the independent as an independent for mayor of Redland City and in that contest almost knocked off the uh, now three-term uh, mayor of, uh, of Redlands but also significantly in that seat won every polling booth so that will be one to have a look at. One of the things I'm interested um, in teasing out a bit is what are the sort of federal overlays that may be occurring in this campaign. I think Graeme mentioned earlier that Scott Morrison had spent, a, you know, basically spent a week in Queensland last week up and down the coast uh, campaigning. We saw nightly news, saw him on, you know, going around some in some sort of tank at one point. Um, at the last federal election, the LNP... Yeah. The, the last federal election, the LNP won, what, 58% of the two-party preferred vote. You mentioned some suites, seats where they're getting swings of, of, of 10%. So I'll sort of question in a couple of parts, I suppose. One, is there any, are there going to be any federal national factors that overlay on this campaign? Will Scott Morrison's popularity uh, have any um, boosting effect for, for Deb Frecklington and the, and the LNP? And yeah, then look, secondly... I think the other part of that question is interesting is why are things so, why is it so different at a state and federal level between, you know, Labor winning, being in power for 25 of the last 30 years at a state level yet federally, um, but, uh, LNP being so strong in Queensland? Yeah, yeah. look, the, the, the issue is it's not so much a federal issue and a state issue that got Morrison those votes in there. It was basically to do with coal mining, mining in general, uh, support for the regions, but also culture. Um, so, you know, in the federal election, we had Bob Brown doing that big convoy up to, um, to um, the Galilee Basin. Uh, you had locals refusing them service in pubs. You had a counter demonstration going on. You had federal labor being very much in the green left Mold at that election, you had um, uh, Bill Shorten promising that we were going to be uh, what uh, carbon neutral or whatever by 2030. Anyway, there were those sorts of promises there. We were going to have 50% of new car sales being electric by 2030. Uh, all those played in, uh, and the people in that area felt that they'd been neglected, and Labor voters in that area felt they'd been neglected. 
And Bob Brown just underlined that by going up there and turning into a really big, um, um, uh, not just an issue, but you know, he made a, an event out of it. Um, so that will have burnt quiet and down a little bit, but the same uh, feelings will be there. And when I say cultural issues, you know, like you acknowledge the uh, former owners of the uh, traditional owners of the land. I doubt whether you'd have too many meetings in the area start off like that. Uh, people feel alienated from those sorts of things. Um, so, so that's one issue. Why has Labor been so dominant? Well, um, why was the, the uh, National Party so dominant, Liberal National Party dominant between 57 and 89? That's part of your answer. 89 was so traumatic when you found that a government had been so entangled in corruption that even though that government had tried to tidy itself up, you know, J.B. Ockie Peterson had gone uh, a couple of years before the election, uh, but the National Party was still seen as tainted and people wanted to move as far away from them as they could. So that set it up for Wayne Goss and uh, he then got through till to 95, 96. So he got uh, seven years off the back of that. Uh, and the 95, 96 period was when I was running elections for the Liberal Party. So it was a coalition operation. Uh, and uh, we beat Wayne uh, on a, a very psychologically smart uh, campaign. It wasn't that people wanted to vote him out. They didn't. Uh, it was they wanted to send him a message. We didn't expect to win that election, but the, the strategy actually worked better than we could have possibly dreamed. Uh, but the problem with that is they kind of fell into office. They only got two and a half years. And then at the end of that, you had One Nation came along in 98. And you had the, Alan, or the Liberal Party uh, saying they'd preference One Nation um, before they preference the ALP as a matter of principle. And that then led to a huge boil over in Brisbane, um, which is what you still see there in the vote in Brisbane, uh, where people here decidedly turned against One Nation and said, no, we're not going to risk them being in government. So they, they turned against the, uh, the Liberal Party. And then, you know, so then Labor was reasonably safe. Peter Beattie, masterful politician. Uh, who would have thought that off a scandal being the Shepherdson inquiry, he could have actually improved his majority, but he did. You know, he went from being a minority government, dependent on the member for Gladstone, to having, I think it was a 14 seat majority, uh, which in Queensland terms is pretty high. Um, and then, you know, it was Campbell Newman came along and then Campbell had this huge result, but threw it all away. Uh, and now you've got this tenuous situation of a minority government, which makes it look like it's safer for the ALP than it really is. And one of the things that makes it look safer is that you have parties like the Catter Australian Party and One Nation that have four seats, which would normally uh, probably be uh, LNP seats. Uh, so instead of the LNP being nine behind, they'd only be five. Uh, and then there's another independent who used to be LNP. So that would only be four. So it would be actually quite a, a close um, uh, contest. So I think it's just an accident of a few things that have turned up and I think you've had a couple of really great ALP politicians in there being Wayne Goss and um, Peter Beattie and you've had, uh, um, well Campbell's a mate so I better be careful what I say here but I wouldn't admit he's, that. He's, <laughs> well he's got some spectacular virtues but he's also got real downsides and um, there was no one who could keep him in check so you know he went up quickly and he went down quickly. I think the Borbidge government was just very unlucky that One Nation came along when they did. So Rachel, federal implications, is there any, any does it matter yeah, what Scott I, Morrison says in Queensland? This is super interesting. You know, um, Labor federally holds six out of 30 seats in Queensland. Um, in 19, after the 1975, you know, after the Whitlam defeat, we had one. Um, so you've got this really very well established phenomenon over a really, really, really long time um, that the Conservatives are the sort of natural federal party in Queensland. And yet, as you said in your question, um, you know, Labor is pretty well established as the natural party of government at a state level, and it has been since 1989. Now, Graham talked about, Graham's right, you know, there's a sort of weird and wacky history, stuff happening, One Nation, all true. Um, but, th but there's also, 
um, some cultural stuff in it. The, the one thing that you need to understand about Queensland politics is that it's basically about um, economic opportunity in the regions. Um, that so much of the debate is, is about that. So you just don't want to be kind of too pretentious and you do want to be minded to what's happening in the economy in Bundaberg and what's happening in the, in the economy in, in Townsville. Um, and I, I think that state labour has been really pretty seriously focused, you know, really gets that in, in, the, in its absolute DNA. Um, you know, every Labor cabinet will have, you know, you'd never have a, a cabinet that was really weighted towards Brisbane and the southeast. You know, you'd have to have representation from the, from the coastal cities. So I just think that there's a, a deep cultural understanding um, in state Labor that is harder for federal Labor to have, except when there's a Queenslander who, who's the leader, as he did with Rod. Um, and that remains a sort of entrenched difference. You asked about Morrison. This, I reckon, is really interesting. So a couple of months ago, I thought... Um, so a couple of mo months ago, Morrison, in the course of a week, went in really hard um, attacking Stacia Palaszczuk about the borders. Um, and what had happened was that a woman had come up from well, wanted to come up from Canberra her father had died um, and she wanted to go to the funeral you know as you would um, and she couldn't because there was a, a the funeral wasn't delayed there was a um, you know she had to quarantine she missed the funeral she went public Morrison really got in on the back of this and um, said the premier was heartless ran very hard on the issue and it was pretty Divisive, you know, he gained some strong support, but, but Palaszczuk said, um, he's a bully and I won't be bullied about this. So then you got this sort of real gender angle running on it as well. I, at the time, thought, you know, this is their warm up for um, the state campaign. Morrison is really going to seek to intervene in Queensland and he's going to try and make himself into a miracle man, you know, not just by winning last year's federal election, but by trying to get the state LNP over the line. Um, I think that Palaszczuk actually resisted him reasonably well. Um, I, she's a pretty solid sort of figure. And so going after her and saying she's heartless, um, which was a bit gendered, wasn't kind of great. And I think he didn't quite line up what's the... How do you frame her? What's the attack on her? So he just kind of went away. <laughs> um, he then spent the week of the camp, first week of the campaign up here, but it was really seen as you know he's trying to raise the profile of the state leader of Frecklington, who's not particularly well known. So long story, long answer, but I don't think that the feds are actually really super engaged and I don't think there's any really live conversation about Morrison's relative popularity um, being a factor in this state campaign. This is the state leaders kind of doing their own thing and it'll play out on their terms. I wanted to spend a couple of minutes before I ask you the, the big question, who's going to win, on what do you think the... I mentioned earlier that this is the first election where the prize is a four-year term. There's been electoral reform um, uh, in Queensland the last term of the parliament. Um, the new government gets four years. Uh, do you think that's going to have any uh, impact on the way governing occurs in Queensland? It's a, you know, it's a third longer, the term. Um, and in thinking about that question, what do you think, sort of based on what the campaign's been like, um, what do you think it might do in terms of the issues or the way or the um, appetite for reform that either side of politics, should they win, um, thinks about doing over the course of the next four years? I think it's a real... I think it will change things quite significantly. Um, I think it's a, it's a really significant reform that's just been talked about here for absolutely ever. Um, Palaszczuk got it through 
you know, pretty sort of seamlessly and doesn't, I think, get enough credit for the way that that will just fundamentally change Queensland politics going forward. Um, three years is mad. You know, you have this sort of three years and um, discretion about, you know, and variable terms. Um, so you quite often get two and a half. So there's just this sort of slight sense of chaos in, um, in politics and in government all the time. So it's partly four years, it's partly that it's four years, but it's partly that it's fixed terms. And that just creates much clearer air um, for serious governance and for actual reform than we've had before. So I imagine that, um, you know, it allows you to plan a term um, so I think that uh, our government and governance will be more sober, better structured, of a higher quality, um, you know, that will just run the show. You know, there'll be, there's more room for do some hard economic reform in the first year, um, you know, roll it out in a, in a, steady, in a steady way. Um, I can't tell you exactly what that means will happen. You know, neither party are going to this election saying, here is our great big reform agenda. It's not that sort of election. So I can't say, therefore, these are the things that will necessarily take place. But I do think it means that the, simply the quality of government and governance will be kind of more sober and better going forward. And it's a really big deal. Right. Yeah, look, in theory, I think uh, four-year terms are... Uh better than three year terms, um, but I'm not sure it's going to make much um, difference. You know, I'm looking at the, uh, the two sides and um, I'm not seeing uh, any zeal for doing more than fiddling around at the edges. Um, I think you know, both, both sides are really looking at, at business as usual. And I also have some concerns about our public service here. In fact, our public services around Australia, I think we've done ourselves a disservice by moving to this uh, almost consultancy model where, uh, or certainly the Washminster model, where people move in and out of the public service at the top levels. And uh, I think there's a lot of institutional uh, knowledge has marched out the door and there's an incapacity in the, in the civil service to both act um, impartially and also to act effectively. Um, and, you know, I've got examples here uh, uh, that people tell me about um, where, um, you know, things just aren't running as you would expect them to run. So four years might well mean that um, bad governments get uh, an extra um, year to um, run the place badly and you get a bigger eruption at the end of it. Interesting. We've had some pretty big eruptions at the end. Of it. Yeah, I was going <laughs> to say it. Yeah, <laughs> about four years too. yeah but um, um, I, I don't think... And Queensland's different uh, uh, from the other states in that we don't have an upper house anyway. So... Um, if you get the numbers, there's been a, a reasonable ability to, to ram stuff through fairly quickly uh, in a way that you don't get, say, in New South Wales uh, at the moment. I'm not sure of your upper house in Victoria. I think it's easier to negotiate, but still that holds things up a bit. Whereas in Queensland, you want to do it, you do it. Great. All right. Well, we're almost out of time. Big question. Who's going to win? How close is it going to be? Graham, you've, you've, it you've said. Turn. Yeah, it must be my turn. Look, it's your turn, absolutely. My gut tells me that a minority gov Labor government is probably the most likely outcome. And that because Labor's going to lose one seat, they might pick up another one. Um, Who with? But, Who's or, the minority partner? Well, the, I'd say they go for Sandy Bolton, who's the independent and Noosa first. Um, so there's a there's a slight tradition of uh, independence from the Sunshine Coast area becoming Speakers of Parliament. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter Wellington, the member for Campbell, yes, having been Speaker for a period of time there. So that would be what their first option, I would have thought. And then after that, they'd um, have to um, see whether they could either um, bring Catter or um, the Greens over the, um, over the line. Um, I'm assuming that One Nation might hold their one seat in Parliament, but that's by no means um, certain. Uh, it's a seat that Catters could take or, or the LNP could take. So who knows whether One Nation will be there, but I couldn't see Labor having any sort of arrangement with um, One Nation, but you know I could see them having an arrangement with uh, Catters. So 
you know, they've got enough. You to think Catter? You think Catter had sign up to a labor labor government? Yeah. Well, no, you just have to um, say, look, we'll support you on um, money bills and bills and, and motions of confidence. You don't have to be part of the uh, the government. And, you know, that's, we have plenty of minority governments on that kind of basis. Um, but, you know, they've got more to play with there. Uh, whereas the LNP, so Labor's got to lose a, a few more than I think the LNP have got to win to be in the same sort of bargaining position when it comes to minority government. Sure. What's your What's your tip? Oh, look, it just <laughs> pains me, right? Um, I, I really find it very hard to, to say, to be honest. My, the, 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 my bones say um, Labor majority government because um, it's been a pretty, for two reasons, it's been a pretty solid government. The pandemic has dead set, been managed well, um, and through the campaign, the Premier has rolled out um, a not overly ambitious, but quite strategic and well-targeted um, economic plan. Um, and she just looks confident. So therefore, you know, I say that's where you'd be likely to land. But as I said at the beginning, in sort of social media land and whatnot, it's really hard to read. So I would go most likely um, Labor majority government with majority of up to about five. Next most likely, Labor minority government. Um, and interestingly, you can do business with the, with the CADAs. I had a lot to do as a minister with one of the CADA members. Um, he was just a really sensible, reasonable character. So you, it, you shouldn't assume, you know, having seen the Bob Catter and Gillard thing, that the CADAs wouldn't necessarily deal with Labor. That, that is actually a live possibility. Um, and politically, that might be better than ending up potentially with um, with the Greens. So, little, I'm not, I haven't got total confidence, but I, I that's what my gut says. Right. Well, it's going to be an interesting two. The next two Saturday nights, I think the the nation are going to be turned to Queensland. Firstly, on this Saturday, the oh, AFL yes, Grand you Final. Are. Well, First we host time. your Grand Final. That's right. First time out of Victoria, and you can you can take the grand final out of Victoria, but you can't take the Victorians out of the grand final. So we're very <laughs> excited that it's a Richmond Geelong clash at the Gabba, uh, and then the following Saturday night, of course, we're going to sit down and watch the returns come in um, from right across Queensland and see whether we will have uh, another incumbent re-elected in these. So Graham and I are going to be on uh, local ABC for. Fantastic. Oh, well, we'll have to tune in. For those who want to listen online. News radio. news radio as well, Rachel. Oh, and news radio. You get it everywhere. Yeah. Right around the country. <laughs> we'll be able to see whether these predictions have come true. So, Graham Young, thank you very much. Rachel Nolan, thank you very much. And thank you to everyone who's joined us uh, on this special inside look at the Queensland election. Um, make sure that you keep subscribing to the McKellie Institute's emails, keep you up to date on the things that we're doing, whether that be in Brisbane, Sydney or Melbourne. Um, and we look forward to seeing exactly what happens um, when the votes are finally cast and counted on the 31st of October. Thanks very much.